So anyway, welcome in to uh, a career adventure conversation. And, and uh, tonight we get a chance to visit with uh, two people that used to work for the mouse uh, or work alongside the mouse, Mickey Mouse and Disney uh, with Dan and Valerie Cockrell. And uh, it's a great opportunity to bring you two on uh, this evening or afternoon, no matter, depending where you're at. And, and, and hear your story, hear the career adventure that, that uh, you two have had along the way. Um, you know, I, I followed your dad initially, uh, Dan, uh, through the years with his books and his time and his podcasts and things like that. And, and uh, you two uh, gave up, uh, at least Dan, you gave up your W-2 job and Valerie, you'd done that some years before uh, to take it on your own. And, uh, and, and what happens right now, it's uh, you're working for yourselves and, and coming through the pandemic and, and all the things that uh, had come with that and how you evolve and how you've adapted and, and, and have built a business. But um, again, thank you for joining in tonight. Thanks for having us, Nate. I really uh, look forward to this evening. We love um, hopefully sharing with people who are watching uh, some of our uh, adventures, our missteps, our uh, decision making as sort of we've navigated our career in our lives. So as we get into this, and uh, if you're joining in, you're probably familiar with uh, with Dan and Valerie and, and the background they had with uh, Walt Disney and and uh, and the uh, the trivia note is who was I should I should put this in a poll, but which cockerel was the first to work for the mouse? Was it Dan, Lee, or Valerie? And uh, it was Valerie that we all came to know. So that's right. Um, yeah, that's I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm going to start right there, as uh, uh, many so far on this call are, are not as familiar with uh, really the brains behind the operation, right, Dan and Valerie, uh, of, right. of where Absolutely. things go, of, of, uh, of Valerie. A little background on you. We spent uh, some time on Zoom here a month or so ago, but, uh, you know, you talked through uh, growing up in France, and I think one of the hardest things you said was traveling off to uh, London to Cambridge to learn English, and then your life just kind of started from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having us. Um, always happy to uh, talk to uh, young, emerging, hopefully emerging leaders and, and new professionals, and hopefully we can help them transition um, by sharing some of our insights. So, um, yeah, I was born and raised in France in Lyon, which is southeast of France. It's probably the second or third biggest city in the country. Um, and when I was 16, uh, 16 and a half, more or less, I graduated early from high school and decided that I wanted to go learn English uh, because I wanted to travel. And I figured at that point that English had to be, you know, the most useful language anyway. So I moved to London and um, I literally arrived in London with 10 words of English. And uh, I could say, my name is Valérie, I'm French. And that was it. And uh, I went for the full immersion, lived as an au pair with a family and babysat and two classes at the same time. And, you know, gradually after three months, I could function. After six months, I could uh, have a conversation. And then my English got better after that. Now I still keep that French accent and, um, I try to disguise it as much as I can, but hey, it is what it is. Um, so, um, and well, I guess, uh, I guess that I'll really ask. really set the course for my life. Okay, so you know, as you as you grow up in in France, and you grow up in different country, and I've talked to, uh, I was talking to a young man and a and his dad from the UK, and and we got on and he'd found out the the work I was doing, trying to help high school kids and people trying to figure out what their next steps are. And uh, it's, a, it's a different process uh, overseas in the UK. I imagine it's the same thing in France. Do you have those conversations uh, going through, uh, uh, I guess, school? I guess I'll compare it to whatever high school is, is, is termed over there. Um, what is the process when someone, do, do people say, what do you want to do after uh, you're done with school, Valerie? What were you thinking then? Or what was that process over there? Um. It wasn't my generation. I think the idea was, you know, you got to figure out your own path. I do know that now it's something that they, they're a lot more proactive about, uh, making sure that they direct uh, young kids and teenagers towards their strength. And what I really like about the French system, actually, is that 
by the time you're 13, 14 years old, you know, some teenagers are not uh, built for the typical uh, academic course. And they will give those, those uh, students an opportunity to go into a more hands-on way of learning. And, and then it's not a vocational school like you call it in America. It's sure. more, uh, more a kinetic way of learning. And then those students have the opportunity to come back and tap back into the what I would call the main, probably the most uh, uh, popular course. So it's just a way to adapt and give a little bit of flexibility to the system so, so students can find their own way and learn you know, at their own pace also. So I really, uh, I think they do that really well now in France. And one thing they do also, they develop a lot of uh, uh, internship. Uh, um, apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. So you go to class for a month and then you go to work for a month and you do that for three or four years. And that works great for organization and it's a terrific way to learn for students. So um, that did not exist when I grew up, but I know it's a big thing now. Um, in my case, it was more, um, you know, I knew that I wanted to travel. I think there was, I realized at that point that there was a world out there that I knew nothing about and I was really curious about it. So that's what brought me to London in the first place. So then I guess let's, let's jump across the pond this way, Dan. And, and uh, when you're growing up and moving across the country with your dad from his hotel job to hotel job, and you're kind of seeing what his life is and his lifestyle and, uh, and where you're at. Um, you know, I guess along the way, I, uh, rugby was, uh, was, made, was your passion that you were looking at and you talked about maybe going to play beyond uh, your college days. But uh, what were you thinking uh, uh, growing up of what you were going to do? Were you, were you resistant going into the hospitality business early on or was there something else you were looking at? Yeah, I was, um, you know, I really had no, no plan. Um, my grandfather was a naval architect my first cousin is a is an engineer, and our son is an engineer. So it, it that those those hit a lot of different people in my family, but it certainly didn't hit me. Um, I was always someone who was very into social situations, like to interact with people. Uh, you know, playing sports was a great uh, outlet for me to practice my leadership skills and my influential skills. And so, growing up, you know, I, I look back. I wish I probably had taken high school more. I don't know if more seriously, but um, I just was kind of there going by and not really thinking much about that. But I did grow up in a family where I was exposed to hospitality. And I really, it's such a dynamic profession and it's very social and you're problem solving every day. And there's a lot of energy you need to expend. And so I, as I kind of went moved through school, I started to realize that's probably what I wanted to be doing. Um, growing up, I worked at, you know, I was a, a waiter in restaurants. I was a bar back. Uh, you know, I had those hospitality jobs. And not only was it good money at the time, but it was, I really enjoyed helping people. I enjoyed serving people. I enjoyed interacting with people and giving them great service. And that was just kind of wired into me. And so when I got out of college with my political science degree, I looked back on the experiences I'd had in college working, I worked for Sheer Saline Investments one summer and really didn't enjoy that. I'd waited tables, I'd worked on the Disney college program. Sure. And so this seemed like a great place if I was gonna go ahead and take a chance and go try something and see where it led, working at Disney seemed like a, a good place to go. And uh, that's what I ended up doing. So talk through that, uh, talk that, that uh, political science degree, where did that come into play? Yeah, so, it was, you know, it's funny how we make decisions. Um, at, when I was growing up, um, history was always interesting to me. Um, I loved mythology. I loved, you know, this, the, the Greeks and Romans and understanding how they lived and all the stories. And so somehow when I ended up um, going to Boston University, um, one of the reasons I went there, I was a walk-on on the football team. And turns out I was too slow and too weak and not coordinated enough to play at that level. And I learned that after a year. And that's why I played rugby. You know, some people say, stick it out. Don't quit. I'm like, no, quit and go do something you can be really good at. Sure. <laughs> that was my motto. And so I did that. But political science, I think it was, I could have picked anything. I was um, interested in liberal arts. 
I just wanted to learn different things. I've always been interested and curious about learning lots of different things. And liberal arts is literally the thing where you can learn as, as many things as you want to. Political science was my major, but I literally took um, uh, mo uh, classes on movies, uh, cinema. I took classes on Greek and Roman sports. I took classes in history. So it was very eclectic and it was just very interesting to me. The problem is to a certain degree, when, once you get out of school, you, you don't have any skills you've learned in class that you can apply to anything. Now you've, you've gone through the process of living by yourself and learning how to do your laundry and be independent. But uh, unlike an engineer or maybe pre-med, you don't ha actually have any skills. And so from there, it's time to go, as I like to say, the kind of the college of life, go learn the lessons of life and get out there and uh, that's, you know, that's how I started business. I guess, yeah, looking back, and this is a question for, for both of you, and you look at where you ended up, uh, I, I suppose, after college age or what it was. Um, if you rewind, what, what choices do you feel like maybe you should have looked deeper at uh, or maybe could have made? It's hard to say it now based on where your lives ended up, right? Um, but hindsight, you know, what, what's something that came up that you want to make sure you let you let your three children know or their friends or other people you come across when they are making this type of decision to uh, follow a, a major or a college or a, an occupational path? Any yeah. insight? They, they, for me, it's funny because I'm we really currently working on a project where I'm uh, uh, deep into the strength finder thing. And in retrospect, I think what all the parents or all the students or teenagers should definitely do, find out what they're good at and pursue that. I think too often we try to direct kids and students and teenagers towards you know, filling up the gap of what they don't know. Well, find out what you're good at. And I think Dan just said it when he said, you know, I went to play football and realized after a year I wasn't good enough. And instead I quit and I started focusing and finding something I was good at, which was rugby. Um, and so I, in retrospect, I wish when I was a student, when I was in that, uh, you know, in that age group that somebody would have told me that, said, you know, look at what you're good at and, and gravitate towards this and develop it and really making making a strength versus discovering it by chance, which is maybe to some extent what happened for me. And I fell into Disney. I worked for a bank before I went to work permanently for Disney. And it took me three seconds when they called me to offer me a job. And I was like, sure, sign me up. <laughs> Why? Because even if, if I could not articulate it well at the time, but I, I guess the world of banking was just meant for me. Some people love it and excel in it. And I'm happy they, you know, whatever floats your boat. But for me, it was something else. And then they offered me that opportunity. So I kind of, you know, by luck, I, I guess, fell into what was my calling. So. And I would say, um, similarly, when I was growing up, you know, luckily, I had parents who were you know, paid attention. They, they encouraged the things they knew that I enjoyed doing and was good at. They knew that I was going to figure out my path. You know, my, I think my dad's point of view, he grew up with a single mom in Oklahoma and, you know, left and, and, and created a career. So I think his point of view was your path will reveal itself. As long as you get out and get experiences and are open-minded, you will, you'll figure out what your path is. Um, however, um, sometimes that doesn't, uh, it, you know, kids don't have the same opportunities they're either told what they should do by their parents, or maybe their college counselor or high school counselor tells them what they think they should do. And they take that as gospel. And that becomes what they end up doing. And maybe 10 or 15 years later, they realize, you know, I was, I was, I do okay at this, but boy, once I get in that other job, I didn't realize how great I could be because I was in the right place. And they just don't have that information. Um, there was a study uh, I read about recently that was done and they talked to teenagers uh, and they asked them how, how self-aware they were on a scale of one to 10. And of course they all answered seven or eight. And then they, they uh, asked 40 year olds uh, how self-aware they, self they were. And they said seven or eight. And they said, well, how self-aware aware were you when you were a teenager? Oh, probably a three. And then they asked 70 year olds how self-aware they were. 
And they said, probably a four or five. Well, how about at 40, two or three? How about when you're a teenager, a two or a three? But they knew, okay, I've, I've had enough time in life now to know when I'm 70 that I probably, probably still have a bunch to learn. But at, at, as a teenager at 40, they kind of thought they knew everything. And so they didn't have a context. They didn't have a point of view. So if I had had something like, you know, simple as strength binders or Myers-Briggs or something for someone to come to me and say, hey, take this assessment. It's not the, it's not going to be the, the, the answer to your life, but it's going to tell you in an objective way, the kind of environments you should be in where you're going to be successful. Um, it would automatically get a lot, out a lot of professions and maybe things that weren't, that weren't aligned. And um, that would have been helpful. Um, I don't have any regrets, but boy, it, it is such a, a, a random path. And right. I think that happens right. in life. But the random path can be a little less random if you really hone in on what you can be great at. You can get, you can be very good at lots of things, but the world is so competitive today. You got to figure out what you can be great at, uh, not just very good at. And uh, if if you can figure out that path early on, I think you get much more successful. You're happier, and um, you have a better better experience. And well, in, so, in true, go ahead, Valerie. I'll, I'll something real quick of um, in truth, if you ask around you, people in there, you know. 30s, 40s, or 50s, and ask them, are you doing today the job that you thought you'd be doing when you were a teenager? The vast majority of people will say, no, I never thought I would do that in my life. Um, I can count the people we know who work into the, the passion, that what they were passionate about when they were 10 years old. We have a good friend who's a vet, and when he was 10, he said, I want to be a vet, and he became a world renowned vet and he's outstanding individual, but he's one of the only person I ever came across that said, this is what I've dreamt to do all my life. Uh, on the other hand, I have met a lot of people who were, you know, who had been in the same job for 15, 20 years, and they got to be, to spend 15, 20 years in an industry, in a job, only to realize that, oh my gosh, I hate it. I hate this job. I'm uncomfortable. I'm miserable. I'm frustrated. I'm not successful. I'm not fulfilled. So how do we help young professionals or students to shorten that time? You know, let's not waste 10, 15, 20 years doing a job that, you know, you wake up one morning and, and decide I've been, I'm wasting my time here. Right. So, right. You know, um, I know, Dan, you're big into the Gallup organization and stuff they have. And, you know, their that engagement of, I think it's uh, 75% of the workforce, and maybe it's give or take that, that are actually engaged in the work that they do every day. So, you know, I can think back, I was one of those statistics, I'd sit in my truck going, I don't want to go in there, you know, because it wasn't, uh, I didn't agree align with what, uh, what the work was, or, or uh, the leadership or whatever. Um, and that's kind of a mission of what I get into. I want, I want anybody I'm working with, no matter what age, that you're excited to go to work, you're excited the work that you're doing. Um, and you guys have, I'm sure have seen that along the way, even working for a, a company like Disney, you would think, well, it's the most magical place on earth, right? You should be engaged. I'm sure you saw many examples through the years of, of people coming out of college or, uh, along their career that that wasn't the case. Is that right? Yeah. The good, the good thing about Disney or the good thing about any company that has a really strong culture, you learn much faster if you don't belong because this culture is so strong, you can't fake it, you, you, know, you run out of energy. So unless you really are engaged and really buy into the values and buy into how the work gets done, um, you, you, go, you, you, you either get fired or you leave on your own because you just don't fit and uh, that's good. But there are, um, there's lots of companies where you can go in, and you're like, yeah, I'm comfortable, I'm making money, I'm getting by, I guess this is what work's supposed to be like. But until you really get to um, experience what, what doing your passion for a living and being able to do things you're good at every day, you don't realize how great it can be. And, uh, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons people say, well, how did you, you know, how did you do so well at Disney? I said, well, I was lucky enough to maybe stumble into a company and a place that fit me really well. Uh, the things that Disney valued were my talents. And so it wasn't hard for me to perform because they said, you need to build relationships with people. You need to be positive. You need to have a lot of energy. You need to get people excited. You need to enjoy working in a highly structured environment. You know, for a lot of people, that's like the worst thing you can do is put them in a highly structured environment. But boy, when you're Disney, 
everything is structured. How many seconds until a server should come to the table to greet you? Uh, how many feet away from that pole should you stand when you're greeting people? Uh, the hand sign you use in the attractions. I mean, it is meticulous and detail oriented. And I love that because that creates clear expectations. And, I, and that's why I love, love sports because it's the, the, the rules are clear. There's no interpretation. Well, there's a little interpretation, but you know, for the most part, it's clear. And so I just thrived in that environment because that's that's how I fit. Um, and so um, it's hopefully you know people will join and quickly realize you know what maybe this is not where I should be. But sometimes they're good enough to not realize it. And as Valerie said, they go along until one day they realize, boy, I just I didn't realize how unhappy I was until I got to go do something else. Or they say, you know what? I'm finally at a point where the money is not as important as it was before. I'm willing to take a risk and go do something else. And when they do that, they say, boy, I should have done this a long time ago because it takes, and not only could it make you unhappy, but it can take a toll on your health. You know, the stress of not fitting in is, uh, it's, it's not a good place to be. We talked a lot last week on the, the session we had at University of Michigan Central Florida Alumni Group. And I've heard you talk through the, the time too of, of, uh, of, of knowing you. Uh, going back to that self-awareness piece. Um, and it's interesting that you said that uh, when you get to be 70, 80, uh, your, your self-awareness is, it goes down because you, maybe you, you feel like there's still some stuff you uh, need to learn or wish you had learned. Uh, but, you know, going back to, and I, I was probably in the same boat as a 16, 17, 18 year old kid. If somebody had said, Hey, you shouldn't be in broadcasting because you're going to make pennies on the dollar compared to somebody else. And this is the hours, this is where it is. I was passionate about it and, and thought, you know, you, what do you know? Uh, it's probably the same when you look at, at playing sports or um, whatever it happens to be, you know, how, I, I'm sure, you know, will my kids listen to me? Well, I hope so. But uh, it's just like uh, in, 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 in baseball, I would go talk to the other coach's kid and the other coach would go talk to my kid uh, to get stuff done. I don't know if you guys had that experience with, with your kids or their friends that, uh, you know, they'll listen to somebody else, but may not listen necessarily to the parent. Would you guys have listened to, to, to someone that gave advice? I guess there's a lot of questions in that, in that, uh, in that segment. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll answer the first one. It's funny because when, when you ask that question, the first thing that comes to mind, our youngest son, Tristan, who currently uh, works for Disney, he's taken a gap year. Uh, because we need to have one cockerel at all time working for Disney. <laughs> That's the wrong. Um, but and we actually, we calculated. Then we've had a cockerel at Disney since 1987. So we we don't want to. We have a good run here. We don't want to break the streak. Um, right. But he uh, graduated from school in 2019, and he was in a very competitive environment. And we knew that he's out of our three kids is the one who needs a hands-on learning, kinetic learner, that kind of thing. And he went and applied to several colleges and wanted to study hospitality. And he had an offer from Johnson & Wales, which is a great hospitality school, but he was determined to go to University of Denver, uh, which is an outstanding school, but University of Denver is a business school with a hospitality concentration, which means being a business school, you have to do algebra, you have to do accounting, you have to do finance. It, this is not the kid who sits, who can absorb this by sitting in a room, in a classroom. We knew that the Johnson and Wells environment would be a much better fit for him. However, he was in this competitive school where everybody was trying to go for one of the top 50 schools in the country. So there was no way we could talk him out of uh, University of Denver. He went there, he did one year and realized that this is not the right environment. That wasn't the right fit for him. So now he's taken a gap year and he's working at Disney and then he's applying to hospitality schools and he just got admitted to Johnson and Wales and we're hoping that either that one or another school will materialize. But no matter what we could have said in terms of be careful, you are heading to a school that's going to be very difficult for you. You're going to be the small fish among the big fish, and it's going to be an environment that won't fit your style. But because everybody around in this school, the pressure, the you know, the 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 uh, always that competitive um, thing, just led him to make you know the wrong decision, really. But live and learn, right? 
so what do you what do you feel like i guess looking back on tristan of what was his eye-opening moment of yeah i should i should have listened to my parents or uh i, sh- I should have pivoted what, what what were or it is time to pivot do you, I don't do you know, know if what that light bulb moment there. was <laughs> i was gonna at say least that. at least at that time the light bulb moment yeah. he maybe had at that time well i'll tell you i don't know if he's had that moment however what we do know is him so you know COVID 19 is the best thing that could have happened to him because he didn't go back to school and that was okay because a lot of kids took a gap year and he went and worked and he has to show up every day on time he has to work hard um he has to be there when people call in sick he has to train people his confidence his uh, ability to communicate i mean we've seen leaps and bounds by putting him in the real world and have him do this and i think he's going to be in a much better position when he goes back to school because first of all, he's, he's built a lot of confidence. And secondly, he's gonna have some real life experiences in school to, com- to talk about. When they talk about how do you handle a difficult guest situation, he can say, well, yeah, I've had a bunch of those. Let me tell you about those. Or how do you, how do you uh, set up checklists and have processes? He's done it firsthand. And that's for me, that's probably worth four years of college him getting that, that experience, and especially that confidence. So he knows what kind of environment he wants to be in. Well, I'll give a lot of credit to, to you guys to talk about this on a, on a webinar that's going to be across social media, that there are parents that, that would not speak of their kid dropping out of school or even taking a gap year or going to, to just go to work. Um, there's, there's that pride issue. And, and I think we all know those parents and we're friends with those parents. And, um, you know, you saying that word in there is one thing that just uh, I've seen so much in the work that I do is, is, uh, is that confidence, uh, that confidence brings clarity. Uh, and it sounds like that's where, where Tristan is at. Um, but, you know, I think if he can, if he's coming out of himself and it's like, okay, yeah, I, I got to make a choice. There was probably a maturity that took place in that process. Am I right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, just getting exposure to the real world and, and, we, we've always had that conversation with our kids. They've always worked, when they would turn 16, they always had to have a summer job. And I remember our daughter, who was the middle child, um, she went to work for horticulture at Disney, which means every day from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., they would be weeding and mulching at Walt Disney World in the summer heat. So I'll let you imagine, but it's not exactly, right. you know, it's not always fun. And, you know, she was a bit grumpy about it. After the first ex- excitement of the first couple of days, she was like, why am I doing this? And, and we kept telling her, you know, this is going to look good on your resume. And she said, well, how does mulching and weeding help in marketing? I want to study marketing. And uh, we said, well, just the fact that you're going to show up to work, that the ability that you are reliable, you show up to work. And just pay attention. You will learn some skills and you will learn about Disney, which is a great organization. And yes, you will be mulching and reading, but it says a lot about you being resilient. And she did this and she's had multiple summer jobs after that. And I remember her calling me one day when she was in college and they were working on that. They had to put their resume together. And she said, mom, I am, I have this two page long resume and nobody else has anything to write on there. And I have all this stuff. And I said, yes, I'm glad you recognize this because this is the day you interview for a job or you send your resume, that's gonna make a difference. Just the fact that you've been able to hold on to a job every summer, uh, regardless of what it is, it's a great experience. And, and now she's 23 and she realizes that some of the stuff she's learned in the process, which may have seemed insignificant at the time, but uh, extremely valuable. And um, she's never had a problem landing a job, probably because of that. So. So, so you proved her right, eventually. You didn't, you didn't gloat too much, did you, Valerie, in that whole process? We beamed or- with pride. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, as you go along, I'm sure you've seen those stories and, and especially, um, I guess, talk through as parents, um, you've seen your, your kids' friends, um, uh, where they've gone or aspired to go uh, as far as the next step of getting into college or this is what they're going to do. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's fun to say that stuff, but um, it, it sounds like there's the, the process along it's, and this is where I get into of, 
Um, you get to that end of that senior year and it's always about what's next. And I love to look over that bridge and see what's after that and then work behind and work backwards from there. Um, I, I'm sure you've got some stories along the way of, of you've heard uh, some of their peers of where they were going and, and, and some things that happened, but, but how did that, maybe they over, you have stories of how they maybe overcome that. Yeah. I mean, we, those moments when you raise three kids, you raise any kids, you right. got moments, you know, it's not like, hi, mom and dad, I'm home. Let's have dinner together and talk about our day. You know, it's that they, they were teenagers and they have their moments where they're not really interested. And there's a lot of pressure on them, whether you bring it or not, they're under pressure. There's a lot changing. And so, um, you know, with uh, our oldest, Julian, um, you know, we went out and got him a, a, a math tutor. He's great in math. And we're like, you can nail the, the, uh, the SAT. But go ahead. We're not a. We're not qualified to teach you. And B, you know, we're all. You're already a teenager. And we're trying to maintain this relationship. And on top of that, to have to try to you know get involved directly in the schoolwork, uh, that wasn't a good plan. And I'm amazed. And I bow down to people that do uh, uh, homeschooling because uh, that's just incredible. And we just want wired that way. And um, uh, same with Tristan. We got him a we got him a tutor. He'd go to tu his tutor uh, two times a week. He'd drive there, get it, and now he's hearing from someone who are not his parents, who are objective and are there just to help him with his homework and not going to talk to him about anything else. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of people will say, "Well, we should we we don't need those fancy tutors. Our kids should be able to learn themselves." That may be the case, but I think if you can afford to get the help and you can go out, I think you, can, you should always look for resources to help yourself or help your kids to be the best prepared they can be. Now, they do have to have some skin in the game. I'm not saying hire five people and do everything for them, but I think to have some outside help is, uh, it takes pressure off you, the parents, it takes pressure off the kids, and you can actually maybe maintain a relationship halfway during those really tough teenage years. Yeah, I, I'm going to bring back that self-awareness piece and, and uh, the Myers-Briggs type uh, personalities or strength finders or the motivators assessment that I use. Um, yeah, if there's so many things out there that, uh, you know, we spend so much time, you know, what college, what major you're going to be in, but what type of work uh, is out there, what type of jobs are out there. And, and uh, we've discussed this a little bit, too. I've been so amazed this past year in the workshops that I've done uh, that you have a young person read through their Myers-Briggs personality type. And it's like, um, this is me. And I don't know why no one ever told me that this was me. Um, because I feel like that generation, unfortunately now, and maybe it's existed for years, um, we, they get, they get told more who they are, uh, and how they should act and which directions should they go. Um, and, and you probably, we, we see adults are, I think in that same boat, but, uh, it, it's important on that self-awareness piece. Uh, especially at a young age, but, you know, how do you keep enabling that uh, to allow, I feel like sometimes we don't give, they, uh, these kids don't feel like they have permission to maybe learn more about themselves. Yeah. And Thoughts? not only that, but developing their self-awareness and realizing that not everybody functioned the way they did. And that, when you become a leader, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit of history about me, but when when I was first promoted, we were working at Disneyland Paris at the time, and I got a, a leadership position. And I used to think that to be a leader, I had to do everything. And I would work 14 hours a day. It was insane. I was involved in everything. I was totally micromanaging. And before you know it, we had a 360 review and the people who were working for me just really did not enjoy it. And I was like, I'll come. I'm, I'm here all the time. I'm available. I'm involved in everything. But nobody had told me what being a leader was. And nobody had explained to me that, you know, people function in different ways. They use their minds in different ways. So sometimes I could get very impatient with somebody who maybe needed a little bit more time to process information. And uh, all of these, so it was I, I could not quite comprehend what I was projecting. So I had very little self-awareness, but on top of that, I was totally oblivious to the fact that not everybody functioned the same way. And as a leader, you know, if you can understand that and you can leverage the different strengths of people around you 
and adapt to them and make sure you can put them in the best spot to be efficient and to be successful. That's, that's what leadership is about, you know? So developing your own self-awareness, knowing where you have blind spots and being able to fill those blind, blind spots with the strength of others, that's it. That's the, that's the recipe of great leaders. Uh, so it's really that, that starting point. You know, it works both ways. It works for you and also opens your eyes to, to, the, to other people around you. Yeah. So we've got about another uh, 18 minutes or so uh, till we get to, uh, to, the, to the bottom of the hour, as I used to say in my radio business. Um, but uh, we've got uh, some people are on our Zoom call. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to chime in and on your mute, your, your microphone, you're welcome to do that or put it in the chat. Uh, I see maybe Claudine's chopping at the bit. I'm sure Letty's been formulating some questions uh, to present, but uh, I think this is a subject we all can relate to because uh, we know upcoming high school students. We were high school students along the way or, or uh, were parents of them, but uh, I'll open up uh, the floor if there's any questions out there or the room, I should say. Crickets. And I, well, I'll tell you, while, while yeah. everyone is coming up with their thought-provoking questions. Um, one of the things that's, there's a, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, we haven't said it, follow your dreams, follow your passion. Um, but there certainly is a practical side to this. It's not about just go off and do whatever you want to do and everything's going to be okay. Um, you got to think about that as like, okay. And, and Nate, you, you, you taught me this, the icky guy yep. uh, principle, which I love. I love that concept. I'll let you explain it. But um, uh, the idea is, hey, you know, follow your dream, but is it, can you go do this for a living? Uh, is it practical for you to do this? You know, when um, I was at Disney for 26 years, there was, a, there was a time when it wouldn't have been practical to leave and go try to be an entrepreneur because we got kids and we got college tuition or raising them. And we didn't want to disrupt their life. But there was a time that we took a calculated risk because they were all sort of semi-independent and we did that. So there's one side of it that says you should go follow your dreams and do crazy things and, and take big risks. But there has to be a calculation on the other side is, OK, it's always nice to have an insurance policy. And I remember talking to Valor after I left Disney. Hey, um, if this doesn't work out, what, what are we going to do? She said, well, you just go back to a company somewhere and get a job. I mean, that was kind of her, her solution. So there was, a, there was an escape hatch. It said, it's not like we're leaving and never going to be able to work again if we can't do this thing on our own. And so I think for a lot of kids, on one hand, uh, they need to be practical about, okay, go study something, but what is that going to turn into eventually? Are you going to work your way into a, a, an environment where you can use the skills and the, and, the, and the thing you're passionate about to actually you know, have a career and make money? Um, or the other side of this, I can argue about both sides of my mouth here is, you know what? You may go down the wrong path, but when you're young, you can make so many different career mistakes. It doesn't, I mean, it's almost, as I tell a lot of uh, students, it does not matter what you do. All that matters is you're learning and all that matters is you're pushing yourself to get new experiences and new things happening. And you're gonna have failures, you're gonna have successes, you're gonna have moments that are just gonna make you cry. You're gonna have moments that are great, but all those are gonna build up into your thirties, your forties, your fifties, and that all those diverse experiences are going to come back and support you in the end. Um, and so that open-mindedness, I think, is real important. So on one hand, what can you go and do to make money at? And the other hand is, you know what? You may try some things you're not, but you can always make a change and keep searching and keep trying. And as I tell students, when we were younger, we didn't have any kids. We were renting our apartment. Disney could have called or anyone could have called and said, you're, you're shipping out tomorrow to anywhere in the world. And we could have gone. And then we had a, a son and then a daughter and then a mortgage and then a car payment. And all of a sudden we right. couldn't take as many risks. And so um, I think students, I think they don't realize how much more risk they can take um, coming through and trying things because uh, a lot of those things are reversible. But I think you're, you've brought it up, um, especially with your youngest, that uh, this pandemic actually you took advantage of. And I think, I think the, the risk that people now uh, or like life is short or parameters are short. I'm going to roll the dice and, and try and go on my own or quit this job I've hated. And, and yeah, I may make less money, but I may be happier. Uh, going back to the icky guy concept that, that Dan was referring to, uh, it's a Japanese uh, concept. Uh, I think it's a reason for, for, for being. 
uh, there's some circles that inter intersect. And on the passion, then it's 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 uh, doing work that you're good at and work that you love. And that's uh, I think a misguided question or or a statement that we make towards young people or anyone is, hey, you should do work you're passionate about. And I I was there, you know, that was broadcasting for me. But then I realized the other two circles, which are, um, you know, can you get paid for it? Uh, that one was in question in my broadcast career. And then also, does the world need it? You know, this has been 20 some years ago when we didn't have smartphones. And yes, we had to get on the radio and tell you that a tornado may be coming and be ready for it. So I guess there's a need there. Um, but as it goes along, those circles, once you can connect them all, uh, there's a sweet spot right in there. Um, I guess you get, you know, looking at, uh, at, at Disney, uh, does the world need Disney? I think you do. You, of course, I'm a little biased and may everybody is, but it's an escape. It's uh, it's entertainment. Um, but yeah, connecting all those things in there is great. Um, I got a question in the chat from Damon. Uh, I'm not sure how, how we'll answer this. I, I want to see what you got, how your reaction is. So uh, he says, it's been a great forum, but he's curious to know when all three of us realized that we were becoming great at what we're doing. Huh. <laughs> Well, you stumped us. Um, <laughs> Damon I sure did. Think, I don't think you really can assume that you're great at anything. My point of view is the older you get, the more you realize life is a journey. There's no specific destination. You can't, you can always be better. Dan's uh, grandfather had a great quote, which is do your best and then forgive yourself. And Dan and I, we have a different interpretation of the quotes. And um, my interpretation is put your best foot forward, put your, you know, your, your best effort into anything you start, but be aware of the fact that you will have to forgive yourself because there is always something better you could have done. Right. And you, there's always people that may do it better than you. And it's okay. You have to be prepared to live with that. Um, we talked with somebody recently and uh, we were talking about the concept of happiness. And she, she mentioned very rightly so that um, it's not about being happy. It's about contentment. So, uh, you know, do your best and that will provide you, give you contentment. And they don't try to go, you know, always and, and critique yourself, I say, uh, but keep learning. It's, that's the thing. So I don't think you can always, you can assume at one point, well, I'm great. <laughs> I'm done. I'm the greatest. Uh, maybe if you're the LeBron James or, you know, the, 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 some of the top, the uh, Rafa Nadal or some of the big athletes, you can, okay, I'm great. But these people, why are they so good? Because they never settle. They always still push, you know, they, there's many books about Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and these guys, why were they so good? Because they never settled. They never said, I'm great. I don't need to practice anymore. I'm, I'm so much, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. So I think it'd be a mistake. That's my two cents. Yeah. And um, a little similar to what um, Val was saying, um, I just, I concluded if I'm doing, if I'm working this hard to do what I do, and on balance, I really enjoy what I'm doing, and they keep telling me I'm doing it right, then I, I should, I belong there. But, but to Valerie's point, and I don't know if this is a, a Disney thing or a personal thing, probably a little bit of both. There wasn't a day, every morning when I went to work, I was nervous, because I knew I got to go in there today, and a lot of people are counting on me to do what I do well and make the right decisions. And you can't let that weight put you to the point where you don't have confidence, but you have to know that uh, you take this seriously. And as soon as you think you got it all wired, that's when disaster happens. And so we, I learned, uh, you know, I think, I think Disney taught me this, always be a little bit paranoid and always know that something can be done better um, and don't settle. And uh, we learned that over time. And I mean, we'd have a great event the next day, we get in a room and say, we're doing this event next year. What's everything we can improve? And people, some people say, can we take a moment to celebrate? And we're like, okay, 10 seconds. Yay. Okay, what can we fix next time? Because we were wired to just keep getting better and keep improving. And um, 
but I don't, you know, like I said, I don't know if you ever conclude your grade, but if you have those moments where you're like, wow, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Everyone seems to love how the results we're getting. And my bosses and the company's telling me that we're doing the right things. That's about as close as you can get on it. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question, Damon, that, uh, you know, I, I guess we should be, uh, we should thank you for, for that or thinking that, but yeah, I think you're right. Valerie, you said, I think if you think you're great, you're probably not, um, you know, as, as you're going along, if you feel like you've reached that pinnacle of where you're at, uh, you, you, you haven't. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate that being in there, but, you know, I think, uh, I, I, I don't know how you two are, but I, I get a compliment. I don't know how to take it because I feel like I still got work to do. I don't know if you guys feel that same way when people reach out to you or, or, or tell you good job on the stage or a project you're working on. Yeah. I, I was coached on that. And this is one of the things that we had a great conversation earlier this week about the balance between confidence and humility. And, uh, I, I was coached on that when people said, Hey, great job on that. I really enjoyed that. And I used to, you know, it's easy to say, Oh no, it wasn't that great. No, you, that's not, that's not showing people grace and respect. Hey, thank you very much. I really, I really appreciate you. That feedback you made my day. Give people credit when they give you that and accept that. Um, and sometimes we can be a little bit too humble. And obviously we see lots of examples in the world where we can be too confident. And uh, you got to know, be self-aware enough to know where to be in the moment. Some people, sometimes people don't need humility. They need a leader to step up and tell them what to do and say, I'm in charge and this is what we're doing. And there's other times when they need people to stand back and give the team the credit and let them go and, and step into the shadow and let everyone else be the star. You just have to yeah. learn when the appropriate time is. There's a phrase that I, I would always uh, write back with or say, uh, no problem. You know, someone say, thank you, say no problem. Um, yeah. And just saying you're welcome or, or saying thank you when somebody compliments you. Uh, it, it can be kind of humbling to, to admit to, to do that. Um, but yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's, it makes you think more outside yourself. Um, and that, I guess, come we circle back to self-awareness on this one again. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you that self-awareness piece. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's, um, it's a lifelong uh, journey. And, and most people, I think, or hardly anyone ever gets there. Uh, but if you keep trying, you keep stepping back, you keep looking at how you're doing things, how you're coming across, how you impact people's lives, how you influence them. Um, it is. And that idea, you know, it's a classic expression, you don't know what you don't know. So if I don't know, I'm not self-aware that I'm going to assume I am. And the more you know, the more you realize how little you know about things. And that's, uh, people can, you know, you can accelerate that by being, talking to people who are, are candid with you, uh, being open-minded. Um, and the problem is when you're younger with your parents, that those are not skills that you've developed. And so once again, it's nice to get help to guide, you know, as they say, it takes a village. It takes lots of different people to move someone through. Mentors, grandparents, parents, neighbors, uncles, aunts, friends, and uh, it should it should be a group that should uh, support. In many countries, that's how things are done. And you know, America, United States, people are very um, the, the nuclear family. The grandparents live in Florida. The parents live here, and uh, technology is helping bring that back together. Sure. But I think you got to create uh, that that team around these students that are going to help them navigate um, as they kind of make their way. They need subjective opinions and objective opinions. And then uh, to at least get them in the right direction, and then you take the you take the leash off and let them go, and hope you've shown them how to live their life because they're going to be out of your, you know, they're they're going to be away from you now, and it's all up to them to maybe hopefully use all the things they've learned as they've grown up to make the right decision. Well, I'm talking about self awareness, we've talked about the Myers Briggs, but uh, Damon uh, appreciates this, and and you're welcome, Damon. But uh, uh, he just want to hear any more about how you utilize strength finders in your work uh, with people or maybe how you've seen it used with even some young people. Yeah. So Valerie is an expert on this, but let me tell you really quickly, here's where I, here's where I concluded. Cause a lot of times you think, well, let me tell you about each strength I have and how I individually put that in place. It hit me uh, when I got my strength finders that basically the way I defined it was when I'm with people, I'm better. 
that's kind of how I get it. So everything I did for many years at Disney was if I can be interacting with people, I have more energy, I'm more creative, I'm more inspirational, I'm more influential, I'm better at my job. And so every moment that I spend by myself in my office doing administrative tasks or thinking is, is going to be a non-value add activity. And it just put a high urgency on me being with people because that's what I, I sort of already knew. And that's what Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders told me. And that became my mission. And I literally would look at how many hours a week I had spent by myself versus with people. And I tried to maximize that because I just knew that that was going to be, make me more successful. Um, and that's, that's in simple how I thought about it. Now, Valerie, she's, you know, with clients now, we do a ton of stuff around um, team blending, understanding what people bring to the table. And so she's done a lot of this work. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, understanding people's strength, knowing your strength and understanding others' strength is just um, helps you, you know where to go to find complementary information or a different or approach or a different perspective. Now, people may know their strength and not necessarily seek the other um, point of view, uh, but it's really on you to do that. Um, looking at a group of people and whether they're team members, direct reports, uh, collaborators, and understanding what they're really good at, that opens up a whole other toolbox for you. Uh, you don't only have to rely on your toolbox. Now you can use and leverage some of their toolbox. So that's the way I look at it. And if you, the, when you become a leader, uh, that's really important to make sure. Sometimes you're wondering why is that person not performing? And then you realize that you're not putting them in a scenario where they can use their strength. It's that simple. So uh, it helps you fill the gap, fill your, the gaps, your gaps, your blind spots, and it gives you a whole other resource uh, that you can tap into uh, to see different perspectives. So. And what that so, requires is being vulnerable and not letting your ego get in the way, which is very common with teenagers and especially men in general. <laughs> not being vulnerable and wanting to be able to not show any weakness and, and, and not reaching out to others. And it's, uh, it's something you got to learn early in your life because if you don't, it's, it's, it can be very damaging. Well, and that's, that's back, an up. Go ahead, yeah. Valerie. No, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, being a leader, you, it's not about having all the skills. It's about knowing who has the skills and making sure that you leverage those skills and you get everybody to use them and and you you that's how you build a, a strong team think about as you're the coach you put you want the best players you look at their talent and we being in i'm big on soccer you know you look at a soccer game you you know that guy is good as goalkeeping that's what he's going to do and this one is a defender and this one you know you put people in the right position you're not going to put a uh, somebody who was five foot two as a goalkeeper you know that's not his strength and well it's the same concept with with strength finders is understanding what people are good at and putting them in the right position on the field so they can be successful so i think what i heard in there was you know you can get some people especially young men that that don't want to admit that maybe they don't know uh who they are what direction they're going or the choices made there's a group of a uh, group I work with right now of students, and there's some guys in there that just kind of, I feel like they're known for their athletic uh, success and what their life is beyond that. Uh, it's it's hard to maybe overcome that, and and you probably saw that along with some guys you were uh, you you you've been you've played sports with Dan or have been around that they think I'm going on to college, going on to the pros. Uh, I've had all this success. Uh, it's hard to let some of that go. Um, you know, how, how do you suggest people overcome something like that? To be aware that they can allow themselves to do that and make some choices and take some risk. Well, I, I think I just want to maybe um, um, mitigate what, what you're saying. I think a lot of young students or young professionals have a, they currently have a lot of pressure maybe we did not have that pressure in our generation because um, globalization wasn't a thing. You were competing with the people across the street or across town. Right now, you know, a new professional, they compete with 
everybody across the world. So the pressure is tremendous on them. Um, so it's it's hard to uh, uh, to say that you know they don't admit that they don't know anything. Well, I think there's just the expectation out there is so intense that sometimes you know maybe you just fake it <laughs> until right. you can't do it anymore. You know, right? And especially on the athletics part, I mean that's um, that's that's important. I think for parents and coaches and you know it's you you uh you break your leg you sprain your ankle that that may close that opportunity may close but you're always going to have your mind and your your ability to interact with people and navigate and um i think exposing them to those role models is important i mean you look at the nfl there's more stories about people making so much money and having nothing at 50 but then you look at some really smart players who actually have gone back and become investment advisors to professional players and said, while you're in the middle of your heyday, we are going to make sure you're making the right decisions. Right. We're going to help coach you. So we're going to make you think about the future. And uh, you look at players like LeBron James, who came straight out of high school. His mother was all over him for his whole career. And that's why he was able to actually navigate and become one of the most famous athletes in the world and not derail go off as a 20, 21 year old, like most 21 year olds do, and just get into trouble and blow it away because he had structure around him. He had people that cared about him and kept him disciplined and kept him going until he could get old enough to make some of the decisions for himself. So as we, uh, as we look to close out here um, uh, with what we have, and we, we've got one more that's jumped on here. Maybe they, they thought it was a, a different hour in the day, but uh, but when you look at overall, um, you know, what's the main message you can look uh, to offer to, to a young person or especially their parents uh, to help guide uh, their, 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 uh, their child, their student, uh, their nephew, their family member, their neighbor, and to, and to make some choices that are going to be approaching them here in the next few years? I think for me, the most important thing is letting them find their strength and run your own race, right? Don't don't compare yourself to others or don't um, be victim of the social media, the pressure that's out there. Find your own strength. You know, and the, that whole conversation we're having reminds me of a conversation I had with my kids a long time ago. And I remember Roger Federer had just won the U.S. Open and he had won $1.8 million dollars. And my kids were probably between the age of seven and 13 at the time. And uh, one of them said, mom, how many tennis match did they have to play to earn that much money? And I said, well, seven match. And the kids started talking, well, I want to be a professional <laughs> tennis player and I want to play, so I'll be a soccer player, I'll do this. And I, you know, there's three answers you can give. The first one is you can, you know, kill the ambition with brutal uh feedback and i could have said honey that's a great idea but uh, you may want to be roger federer but the truth is you suck at tennis right <laughs> uh the second answer would be what probably most parents especially in america would tell their kids which is honey you can be whatever you want to be the problem with that is that's not true right because if you want to be a roger federer you need uh, you need the work ethics you need the passion and you need the talent, right? I was telling you earlier that uh, about my husband's singing talents here. Uh, and he loves Or singing, lack thereof. Or lack thereof. He can Thanks. hit a note with a stick, no matter how much he works at it and he practices and how passionate he is about it, he will never be the next American Idol, right? It's well, not gonna happen. It's the, not in the, the early, The early rehearsal, the early audition. So the, the third <laughs> answer to kids and teenagers and young people is to say, you know what, to be a Roger Federer, you have to have passion, work ethics and talent. Now, let's find out what your talent is. And, and once you find it, and you're going to be successful at it, then, you know, this is the work ethic going to come along, you know, you're good at something, you develop the passion, and then you're, you're ready to just invest yourself in there. Because you, you're getting the, you reaping the results of what you have. So that probably would be my, my answer to this question. And I got two words, 
keep talking, keep talking, uh, talk and communicate and talk and communicate and you're gonna get the eye rolls, keep talking, communicating, you'll get ignored, keep talking, communicating, you just gotta keep going. And uh, the amount of times, you know, we'd be at the dinner table and, uh, you know, I remember one night we, uh, Tristan was there and I don't know, he was, he was pretty young. I said, all right, guys, um, as you get older, what do you, what, what is protection? They're like condoms. We're like, that's right. And people are like, you talk to your kids about that way. I'm like, you better, you better talk about it. Hey, you know what? When you're going out tonight, you need to be home by this time because being out late driving is this, and you need to start applying for colleges and you get pushback, you get passive resistance. I mean, but you just got to keep talking and keep moving forward. And you'll get that call one day that Valerie got from our oldest son and said, thank you so much for holding me accountable and, and, and doing these things because I, I just got a job in a biomed company and I'm realizing all the things that I can't give you all a hard time about is the reason I'm here now. So, you know, justice will be served in the end, but man, it's a long, like we used to tell people, tell your kid to look people in the eye and shake their hand a thousand times. And, uh, and someday on a thousand, the first time, someone's going to say, wow, your son or daughter has great manners. They looked me in the eye and shook my hand. And as Valerie's told many people, you don't know how long and how much time and every parent knows it took us to get them to do that. Um, but you can't give up. Well, well, those other people that have joined in the room uh, and if you had condom as the, uh, the Zoom meeting bingo word of the night, uh, you automatically win if you uh, if you drew that out of the hat. So uh, that's, right. that's on the list of 10 words I didn't think would be in our Zoom tonight. But um, <laughs> my whatever. dad just told me that if you're talking to your kids at 12 years old about that, you're probably three years too late. So <laughs> you better you better accelerate what they hear because they see and hear everything. now. Especially nowadays. So I'm going to last last call for questions before they close some things out here. Uh, anybody else in the uh, questions in the chat or? If anybody wants to turn their mic on quick and, and ask something, uh, what is it, ask now or forever hold your peace or something like that? Okay. Um, but uh, Dan and Valerie, I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time and, and the relationship that we've built in, in, uh, in the work that we're doing to ultimately help uh, in, make better engaged uh, people out there, whether they're young or, or older, where it happens to be. And, and uh, we talked a lot about Myers-Briggs and Gallup. I'm gonna send you guys uh, a couple of motivators assessment codes. I want you guys to take that and just kind of get a sense of what you think of that uh, and, and see, uh, bottom line, what there's seven uh, things that come through. Uh, what gets you out of bed? What motivates you? And, and I've talked through this in sessions I have and they always say, well, it's money. And 10% uh, of the workforce is actually motivated uh, by money. Uh, and it comes down to some other things and that can be eye-opening uh, for companies and, and people to, to really see. But uh, um, it, it's great to, to have you on and hear your stories and, and your career adventures and, and how they've all kind of worked through. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate Thank it. you. We appreciate it. But uh, if anybody's out there and, uh, and you're interested in, in your icky guy or have somebody that uh, is trying to find their way along, as, as, as Dan was talking a lot, as, as you both have had those experiences, Dan and Valerie, uh, I invite you to, uh, to go to, the, to, to nateclayberg.com or nateclayberg.com slash Cockrell in there. And we'll put that uh, when we repost this. But uh, uh, Dan, uh, we've talked a little bit about the, the work that, that I get into and, and, uh, and some compliments that you've given me. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun work to be a part of and, and filling my icky guy. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Nate, that's, yeah, this is one of the big reasons we wanted to get on and, and, and have this conversation tonight. Because first of all, we know how hard it is being parents and having high school or college students who are trying to figure out their path in the world. And uh, we've seen the work you've done with young people. Uh, and once again, being that objective voice that takes the emotion out of it and really helps them think about it. And as I know in your case, sometimes, you know, doing the same thing with the parents and educating them. Uh, you know, I know you shared some stories and sometimes the parents have concluded that the, the, their son or daughter is agreed and is happy with their choice, but they're not. And they're just scared to tell them this is right. maybe not the path I want to take. And so there has to be a conversation, a dialogue. And I think the the structure and the process you go through to get, you know, to
to get kids and students on a path, at least to get them out of the gate is extremely helpful. And I wish um, we had had your services when our kids were younger. Once again, just have someone to go chat with and uh, not, um, not uh, once again, have to talk to their parents because sometimes that relationship can be detrimental in these cases to some of those uh, high charge conversations. Yeah, I always say I'm, I'm that parent that's not their parent. Uh, that they can uh, look to have conversations with and in some direction. And ultimately it's, you know, I want them to have that graduation story that uh, this is that time of year. And if anybody on the call is going to go visit a, a graduate here in the upcoming uh, near future, uh, you know, and asking them, you know, when they get that asked that question, I feel like sometimes they want to hide under the table or run away of, you know, what are you doing next year? But uh, that's a process I go through and, uh, in, in trying to come up with, and I don't like to necessarily talk about what career, it's more about, you know, what kind of work are you, uh, are you wired to do? Uh, and then let's give you some experience and exposure to prove why that is. I'm big into the Simon Sinek why, uh, if anybody out there follows Simon. Uh, and then let's look at what education or training you may need, if any. And then my two words that I always get into, let's give you experience and exposure. Um, let's prove what you don't know or see what you, uh, that you, you don't see and, and see where it can go from there. So, uh, Dan, Dan and Valerie, I appreciate the time on, on, a, on, a, uh, tonight and all the impact that you've, uh, uh continued to give in the world. The question I had that I'm going to bring up is, um, Valerie, how are you able to now spend so much time with Dan now that he's home more? How have you had to talk um, yourself into to that positivity? You have a half hour? <laughs> That's um, all? There a is, bonus there call. Is, She's condensing it. There is it. such thing as too much togetherness. So uh, fortunately, where we live here in Colorado, uh, he goes to the, to the, there's a clubhouse in the residence where we live. So he goes there and we need our, our, our time away from each other. But um uh, we, we tend to, uh, we complement each other. So most of the time it works. Every so often I have to go to France for a while and just isolate myself. And, you know, <laughs> it works. We make it work. There you go. Well, uh, you two, I, I, I enjoy your time together. I know you got some trips planned and, and some travel ahead. And, and uh, it's been great to again, talk to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nate. You. Have a good have day. Good Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye.